Hello there. This is Angelo John Lewis for the Sacred Inclusion Network. If you're not familiar with us, we're a group of people that are actively exploring the nexus between diversity and spirituality. If you'd like to know more about us, please visit our website, sacredinclusion.com. Today, it's my enormous privilege to interview John Perkins. John has got two different identities, and I'm going to just sort of run them down, and if I miss something, John will tell me. As a former chief economist at a major international consulting firm, John Perkins advised the World Bank, United Nations, IMF, the U.S. Treasury Department, Fortune 500 corporations, and leaders of all the many of the countries in the so-called developed world. He's exposed the nefarious deeds of those of these um, similar organizations that he worked for in his best-selling book, Confessions of an Economic Hitman. John is probably best known to the audience of this podcast as a founder and board member of Dream Change and the Pachamama Alliance, nonprofit organizations develop, devoted to establishing a world future generations will want to inherit. He's won several awards for his humanitarian work, including the Lenin Oko Grant for Peace in 2012 and the Rainforest Action Network Challenging Business as Usual in 2006. His newest book is Touching the Jaguar, which I definitely recommend that you go out and purchase a copy from it or get it from Interlibrary Loan, uh, whatever your want is. John, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much, Angelo. It's 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 great to be with with you, and I, I love your in the sacred community. I I love the everything that you're doing. It's so beautiful. It's so it's terribly important at this time of of crises that have created amazing opportunities. Also, thank you for all you do. It's well, thank you, John. You. Uh, and back at you. You know, um, some people might not be familiar with you, us, and I'm, I'm tr I was trying to figure out a way to go into your origin story without um, having you basically to say the same things you say to all interviewers. You write in your book that you grew up privileged. Um, give me a sense as to what that looked like. Well, I grew up in New Hampshire. Uh, and um, New Hampshire, in those days, I was born in 1945. <laughs> uh, New Hampshire in those days was pretty homogeneous white. And um, you know the, there were there was a there were poor poor folks. There, was a, there were a lot of industries that had failed, uh, the old factories, and the farms were failing because you know, New England farms were not doing well as, up against the big industrial farms of the Midwest. So we had a lot of poverty. And when I went to uh, public school, you know I, I saw a lot of extremely poor kids, uh, but but they were they were white, and I didn't realize at the time how much more privileged poor white kids from New Hampshire are than, for example, uh, you know, even, even kids with more money who happen to be people of color in parts of New York City or Chicago or in so many other places, I had no idea. And, you know, I went to, I went to a boys' pr private boarding school because my dad taught there. I, I, I lived on campus and my dad made almost no money uh, but we had a house that the school gave us, a small house. I ate with 200 boys plus, um, since for the time I was four years old, three meals a day. And these were extremely privileged kids. You know, they, they came from extremely wealthy families and mostly white uh, with a few exceptions. But I have to say the, you know, the exceptions uh, were, <laughs> you know, I don't know quite how to put this, but uh, the exceptions were, were were people of color from different countries who. Yeah, so I was thinking, I was wondering if they're from Africa or somewhere. <laughs> yeah, yeah, or, or, yeah, Latin America, the Caribbean, or someplace where they their families were very wealthy <laughs> right. for the most part. Uh, there were a couple of scholarships that came along later, but but for the most part, and you know, and I grew up and I heard these stories over and over about kids who would go home at Christmas vacation to Park Avenue or the mansions of Buenos Aires or Paris and, and come back to school with these phenomenal stories and this incredible privilege, you know? 
And and it, I didn't look at it that way at the time, but I felt very unprivileged. I felt, you know, like when I went to that school for the last, for the four years of high school, where, you know, I, I went free to the school that my dad taught in. During Christmas vacation, I'd spend almost the whole vacation and my free time in the school gymnasium. I had a key to it by myself, hitting tennis balls off the wall or shooting baskets or lifting weights or something. And, you know, then at the, when everybody came back to school after vacation, I would hear these amazing stories of these these orgies and all these incredible experiences <laughs> that my classmates had had in these incredibly exotic places. Probably most of it was exaggeration, right. <laughs> but some of it wasn't, you know, they were in these exotic places. So all my life, I, I wanted to experience that, uh, which I got to do as an economic hitman. That's, that's another story is how I got you know seduced yeah. into that job. But then when I, before I became an economic hitman, I was in the Peace Corps in Ecuador. And there was one particular experience I describe in the book uh, where uh, I, I was, my wife at the time was with me. Uh, she was also a Peace Corps volunteer. And it was, we just arrived. We got through training. We were up in the city in the mountains called Cuenca. We were headed to the jungle. And our, our boss in the Peace Corps took us in a car down to this market that I'd never seen anything like it before. We'd hung around Cuenca, we'd gone to the nice market, but this was what we call the Indian market. And it was, the smells, <laughs> the smells were just <laughs> outrageous. <laughs> you can't even, they're indescribable. I try to, I describe them in the book, but I don't even remember how I described them. I worked on that one for a long time. And the sounds, you know, there were pigs and there were goats and there were chickens and there were roosters and there were all kinds of things. Things. You ain't in and, Kansas anymore, brother. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and the people, you know, these were these very poor local Quechua speaking indigenous people who who never bathed, uh, basically, you know, they, I mean, they, they had very different. And, and it was shocking to me now but we're waiting for this bus to take us down into the jungle. It's going to be a two day trip to take us down, a three day trip actually to get to, to where I was going to be stationed for the next two years. <laughs> <laughs> and this bu the bus, it's supposed to say El Milagro, the miracle. That was the name of the place we were going to, the miracle. It was so ironic. Uh, There's a story behind that. But so, so we're standing there and all of a sudden this, this old Ford truck pulls up that must have been a out of the 30s, you know, we see the front of it, and, and behind it is this big wooden box with holes cut in it with plastic sheets over the holes. It's the bus. It says El Milagro on it. <laughs> it's the bus. And I, standing there, totally flipped out by this whole thing, like, oh my God, really? And everybody's pushing by us. These people are just crowding on, and they've got their goats and their, and their chickens and their sheep and all these things they're carrying out of the bus. And we're standing there like, oh my God. And suddenly the guy who is the bus driver comes in and says, are you going to El Mar Malagro? And I said, yes. And he says, well, come on. And he, he pulls us on the bus and the, the bus is full. There's people standing. It's all wooden benches on in this wooden bus, a really uncomfortable looking place. But everybody's standing and we've got like a two day trip on this bus and then another day of hiking into the jungle. Like what, we're gonna stand the whole place? Well, there's this elderly couple in the front seat right behind the driver. And he says, and he, and he says something to them. They don't understand what he's saying, but he says something. And they get up and, and go to the back of the bus. And he tells us to sit there. And my God, you know, yeah. it struck me how privileged. I mean, it just suddenly, and at the same time, I was grateful. <laughs> <laughs> Honest man. <laughs> you know, uh, I, I think, and my, my wife said to me, I, I should, do you think we should do this? We're, we're so privileged. And I said, well, yeah, the bus driver will probably be insulted if you <laughs> in <trouble." laughs> Now, John, yeah. fast forward a little bit. Um, we're about the same age, so we probably read a lot of the same literature uh, about shamans and all these sort of people. You know, in my case, it was mostly from, you know, reading Don Juan and all these kind of books, you know. So you've actually encountered shamans, and especially that that trip was a very sort of, um, I guess, an elemental experience for you. And I wonder if you can sort of match your preconceptions with actually um, your first encounter with a shaman. And tell me what that was like. Yeah, well... To begin with, maybe um, that wasn't the first encounter. I don't know, but that's the first one I know about. 
No, it was absolutely the first, and I didn't even know what a shaman was. No, I, you know, I I'd, I'd read about the witch doctors. You know, that's how they were portrayed, and see, you, you saw these, you know, wagon train on television where you know the wagon train is going through the West, and there's an Indian witch doctor, and he's he's ugly and he's cruel and he's dangerous and he's scary. But I I that that was my only experience with any of this. And I'm now, this is sometime later, I'm in the middle of the jungle, I'm this, and I'm very, very sick. Uh, couldn't keep any food down. I, I couldn't stand up without help. And I, um, I was dying. And, and I, was re, I was resigned to dying because I, it was a day's walk through a dense jungle and then <laughs> another two days in this rickety old bus if, if one happened to come along to the nearest medical facility. And the school teacher, the one person I could kind of communicate with because everybody else spoke schwa, the indigenous language. The school teacher spoke some Spanish and my Spanish was terrible, but it, it, you know, it got better over time. <laughs> uh, anyway, he comes up and he says, well, the shaman, we got a shaman here. He's been leading this, this old, this tiny old man by the hand. He, he, can, he can cure you. And, you know, I, I certainly had my doubts, but, I, but at that <laughs> point, I was desperate. I, there was nothing... Uh, there was no other option. And incidentally, the, the, my, my, my wife at the time, Anne, had, had gone to another community for several days to meet with some other Peace Corps volunteers. So I was alone when I got sick like this. And and uh, it was terrifying. Uh, but um, the shaman did heal me that night. Uh, and he healed me by helping me change my perception. And I can get into that if you want. And then, then he demanded as payment for having healed me that I become his, his apprentice. And of course, having graduated from business school in 1969, I had, no, there's no future in shamanism in 1969. <laughs> now it might be a yeah. glamorous thing. Well, the guy saved my life. What could I do? Yeah. You know? so, I, so I did study, I, after that, I, I studied with him and then I studied with shamans in many other countries in subsequent years. Yeah, we're going to get into the economic hitman a little bit, but um, you know, you've 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 encountered world leaders all over the world and powerful people, and you've also encountered these these shamans who have a, a different kind of um, power and energy. I wonder if you can compare and contrast the two things. Sure. So what the shaman taught me was that our perceptions mold our reality. So during the shamanic journey, he took me on that night when he healed me. You know, I saw that. Uh, I had even grown up in New England, very bland foods. It was prep school. They were pretty, pretty mostly canned frozen foods, you know. And, and suddenly I'm eating um, very strange things like squirming white grubs alive. <laughs> it's a delicacy for them. And they don't drink water. In the Amazon, most people don't drink wa river water because they know that it's, it's dangerous. It, it's got a lot of vegetation and fallen trees and decaying matter that's in the water. So the women make a kind of beer by chewing and spitting manioc root. It's called chicha. It ferments, and then you can add water to it because it's alcoholic. It, it kills. You know they know that it's, it, they can drink. They don't know about germs. They didn't know about germs, but they knew you could it's safe to drink this. So I was drinking a lot of that stuff because spit be, spit beer because you have to rehydrate. And there wasn't any Perrier. Uh, eating a lot of squirming white grubs because there were no Cliff Bars. You know. And on that journey that night, I, I saw that uh, every time I ate these things, um, what happened actually was I'm, I'm on this shamanic journey. It's a vision quest. I got my eyes closed. The shaman's there. He's he's humming. He's 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 making these noises, and and I see this amorphous shape in front of me. And the shaman says, and it's just as translated, but he's touched the jaguar. And I'm terrified. I'm in the middle of the jungle, for heaven's sakes. It's nighttime. And I look all around like, where's the jaguar? And he says, no, 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 close your eyes and touch the jaguar. And this amorphous shape shifts into a, a jaguar. And, and I hear this voice like my mother saying, the food and drink will kill you. And when I touched it, I, I saw how incredibly healthy the schwa are very robust uh, you know, hunters and gatherers. Man, they are they are strong people, and live to be very old if they don't die in a hunting accident or something like that. And so that night, I I saw that it wasn't the food and drink that was killing me; it was my perception. And afterwards, when I became the shaman's apprentice, and later all over the world, I realized that the basis of shamanism is that our perceptions mold our reality. You know, there's there's no Canada, there's no United States, there's no 
There's no culture, there's no religion, there's no corporations, except as we perceive them. And when enough people accept a perception or codify it into law, it, it has a huge impact on reality. And I, I came to understand that's also the basis, not just of shamanism, but of modern psychotherapy, of quantum physics, hmm. of marketing, of advertising, of corporations. So I, I'm, I'm trying to get to this your question. Yeah. As an economic hitman, <clears throat> my real time was chief economist. Well, back my, up just a little bit, John. So at some point, it, it, it became clear to you the sort of nefarious um, effects of um, American power, imperial power. Was it during this period or how did that emerge? Obviously, you became an economic hitman and you, you get into that. But uh, I'm just curious as a, you know, I mean, uh, you probably didn't think about it that much when you were 15 years old. No. Oh, no, of course not. You know, so my job was to produce these. What well, was first of all, when I was an economic hitman, after I got out of the Peace Corps, I became an economist, an economic hitman. My job was to identify countries that had resources our corporations coveted, commanded, like oil, and then convince that country that it should accept huge loans from the World Bank or other organizations to and, and use that money, the, the country never saw the money. The money just went to paying our corporations to build big infrastructure projects in the country, electric power systems, industrial parks, highways. And my job was to create these reports and these economic studies that would show that when they do that, the GDP, the economy of the country increases. So this is a perception we're, cre we're creating that by by, by, by t taking these huge loans and using their resources as collateral, their oil under the ground as collateral, uh, hiring our corporations that make huge profit off of this to build these infrastructure systems makes the economy grow. And you can show statistically that the GDP does grow. That's econometric models show that. And I believe that at the beginning. It's what I learned in business school. It's what the World Bank teaches. And but. Later in life, I, as I went through this further, I, I began to see that this is a, a perception, and it's a fake perception. It's not increasing the prosperity of the people. It's increasing the prosperity of a few rich families in the country, as well as our corporations. But, but in fact, the people are suffering because money is diverted from health, education, and other social services to pay the interest on the loans. Uh, it, it took me a while to realize that, but <clears throat> eventually... I did realize it, and 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 I saw that this was a false perception. And to put that in perspective, um, we can say that in the United States right now, there's there's three individuals who have as much wealth as half the population of the United States. Mm -hmm. If those three individuals got a return on their investments last year of ten percent, and half the population of the United States lost three percent. We still show a GDP growth of something or just under five percent, and so this, what I came to understand is that this 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 idea of, uh, of GDP is is a is just a perception, and it's it's not, and it's 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 based on the wealthy people how they're doing. It doesn't reflect prosperity overall. So it's the same idea of perceptions molding reality mm -hmm. that if we if i could sell this perception to the presidents of these countries and they could sell it to their people that by taking out these huge loans by putting their countries deep into debt by basically prostituting their resources <laughs> to our corporations uh their their economy would grow and they would all become more prosperous uh we could move forward with the system which was I would come to understand was basically a new a, a new form of colonialism. Mm -hmm. Maybe not all that new, but but a new a new way of approaching colonialism. It was not about helping the people. Yeah, and China seems to have copied that model. They seem to be doing pretty much the same thing that we did back then, or trying to do. Um, of course, that's a more complicated subject. Um, so, you know, John, you've um. You know, you've been involved in a lot of stuff, right? Um, you, you've, you've, and you've met powerful people. You've served powerful people, and uh, at some point, you got wise to the game, let's say. And um, <clears throat> you know, I, I want to ask you this question because you know, I know a, a number of people that are. Um, it's like they're newly woke. 
and most of the people I'm talking about, they're, they're white folks, you know, they're, they're young white folks. And some of them, they, they feel an enormous amount of guilt for their privilege and all these sort of things. And you address very directly in the book uh, your thoughts about guilt. I imagine you've, you've gone through it a little bit yourself. And I'm wondering um, how you've managed to uh, reconceptualize guilt and what advice you would give to people that uh, maybe felt the way that you did at one time. Yes, Angela, and I'd love to get back to the, the white folks and the Black Lives Matter idea, but let's do that later. Um, you know, a number of years ago, I, I took a group of 33 people to Ladakh, which is an Indian protector. It used to be part of Tibet. And at the end of that trip, we, we were invited to meet with the Dalai Lama in his home in Dharamsala, India. Just 33 of us spent the afternoon at his home with him. And one of the people asked him how he felt about whether he had any regrets or felt guilty about leaving Tibet and having the Chinese take over. And, and he basically said, you know, things like guilt and, and, and regret are, are a waste of time if we wallow in them. But if we look at them as energy, we can use that energy. And I thought about this many times. Um, you know, it's again, it's this, this perception thing. Do we perceive guilt? is holding us back, like, oh, my God, I can't believe I did that. And, or do I see it as a form of energy? And if we see it as a form of energy, we can use it to take actions. So, yes, uh, you know, my life is filled with things that I, I can feel guilty about and do. And it's okay to feel the guilt. But don't, I don't, what I want to do is use that <laughs> to write to write books, mm. you know, and, and if you look at, like, so, so I'm going to just, the book, this book, Touching the Jaguar, I love the Jaguar, but the, the subtitle, Transforming Fear into Action to Change Your Life in the World, you, you could look at fear, that could be guilt, or mm. that could be it, the fear of change or, or whatever. But if we, if we see that, the, the Jaguar, so when you touch that Jaguar, as I did that night in the Amazon, it's, it changes your perception. And if you touch your guilt, if you go and say, well, yeah, my God, I, yeah, all the white privilege I've experienced, I feel guilty. I feel guilty of what I did as an economic hitman and, and so on. Okay, what am I going to do with it? You know, and I consciously made the decision to use that as a, as a, as a springboard because I have credibility. I, you know, so I, I, having the shamanic experience, I've, got a, I've written five books on shamanism. I have some credibility in what we might call the new age community. But I also have written four books on, on economics and global intrigue, including you know, uh, Confessions of an Economic Hitman, which has sold over two million copies. And, and that's given me a lot of credibility in the fact I was chief economist. I speak at major economic events to corporate executives. And so to use the guilt that I feel in a way to try to turn the system around to, to, to transform what, what I and many economists now are referring to as a death economy, this economic system we have today that really is the cause behind COVID-19 and racism and climate change and so many other things. Those are all problems, but they're really symptoms too of this bigger problem, which is our overall system. How do we transform that into a life economy, something that will, will take care of these problems? So, you know, I purposely have, I will go into the guilt, I'll feel it, you know, and, and, but don't wallow in it, use it, take it as energy. I take it to, to write books, to talk mm. to you, to be on this program, mm. to, to speak at different venues. So I, I would encourage all your listeners to look at any of the emotions that they're feeling that they may think of as negative, fear, sadness, anger, guilt, whatever it is, and, you know, accept it, don't run from it. The, the, the shaman said, you know, touching the jaguar means that we identify the things that are holding us back, our barriers, our fears, and we confront them. We don't run from them. We feel them. We go out to them. We feel the guilt. We feel the anger. We feel whatever it is. And when we touch that jaguar, we receive energy from the jaguar or wisdom or creativity, whatever it is that allows us to change our perception. And when we change our perception, uh, we then can take new actions that change reality mm. and you know and the, the example of the food in the amazon is, is a good example of of that whole process but we can all go through that process every day and so anybody who's feeling angry if you're angry at exxon if you're angry at nike or walmart or any big corporation use that anger to, to start a consumer campaign um <laughs> on social networking which makes it so easy mm. by saying hey you know mm. i love your products 
but I'm not going to buy them anymore <laughs> until you pay your workers in Indonesia mm. a living wage or you clean up the pollution you're causing or whatever and, and send that to the company and then send it to all your social networking circles and ask them to send it to the company and ask them to send it to all their social networking circles. And when enough executives get these kinds of letters, uh, they realize that these are their customers. They, they've they got to respond. And, 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 you know, we've been seeing companies doing that, doing that, you know, we're seeing companies take a very, some big companies taking a very strong stance uh, around Facebook and, and around the National Football League and the, yeah. the, the Washington Redskins. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I never thought that would ever change. Yeah. yeah, yeah. well, the owner said it would never change, not yeah. so long ago, he said no. it would never change the name, but <laughs> it was corporations that put the pressure yeah. on on him and the ones that, whose names are on the stadium. Uh, and so we have that kind of power to do that, but we need to take some actions. And sometimes the actions is just sending a tweet, you know, or, or could be running for president. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> it can go from it can go from a very simple thing, <laughs> yeah. which take, take, takes two minutes, to something that you could devote. It's, it's to like life. doing something with the energy. To 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 your point, yeah, exactly. So I don't want to lose this, but you, you said you wanted to talk about the Black Lives Matter thing. A little bit. You, you know, I'm I'm so struck by how we, we need to recognize that th this terrible problem we have with with racism and and white privilege and police brutality uh, are are such serious problems, and we need to recognize that they are symptoms of the bigger mm -hmm. problem, and we must address the bigger problem. So if I go back to the 60s, where I was very active in the anti-war movement and the, the, the anti-racism movement, the integration movement. And if you remember in the 60s, we passed three major laws, acts that, 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 that did away with discrimination. They did away with all these problems, we thought. Yes. Yeah, the Civil, the Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act, and the Fair Housing Act. Uh, but they didn't do away with the problem because the problem was the overall social governmental economic system that we can call a death economy, a system that's based on the perception that the goal of all corporations must be to maximize short-term profits regardless of the social costs, regardless of the environmental costs, mm -hmm. and that the, the goal of all of us as individuals is to maximize our short-term materialistic consumption. And, and that's the problem. And that's created climate change. It's it's created income inequality, racism. It's it's behind the virus. It's created species extinctions and, and destruction mm -hmm. of forests and and so on. So, you know, this time around, I think we have to be so careful that we go out there and hold these signs that say Black Lives Matter, and of course, Black Lives Matter tremendously. And and, and it's good, it's good to put band aids. On the, uh, uh, you know, on the eruptions that are that are, we, we got to you got to deal with the symptoms, but we've also this time around we've got to understand that we've got to go deeper. Mm -hmm. We've got to go to the root cause of these problems, which is a, a, an economic system that's that's failing us. It's bigger than economic, social, governmental, economic. That's failing us on a global basis, and mm -hmm. and until we deal with that problem. The band aids are only going to be short stops. They work for may they may work for a few years, and I think in the early seventies we saw some, you know, we saw some improvements. But you know, and right. and and you know, the same thing with the Vietnam War. We we, we thought we we dealt with the problem because we ended the war. We hadn't dealt with the problem. The war was caused by this death economy. People make a lot of money off war, so now we're back fighting wars again, you know, and losing them again, just like we did in Vietnam. The, the problem is the system that supports all of that, and it's so important that we deal with that. And it, it, to, to deal with it, all we got to do is change the perception. It's mm -hmm. no longer about maximizing short-term profits. Now the goal, the success stories will be the people who, who create long-term benefits for people in nature. And we pay investors to invest in projects and in products, and we pay workers to produce things that clean up pollution, you know, that mine the plastic that's out there floating around in the oceans and all the oil that's leaked all over gas stations around the world and in, and in oil exploitation sites. We pay people to regenerate destroyed environments to recycle, 
to come up with new technologies that we haven't even conceived of yet that, 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 that are going to make today's solar and, and wind look archaic, hopefully. I mean, I'm, I'm glad that we've had the incredible improvements we've had, but we can go way beyond this. We can create what's called a life economy that's an economic system that's based on long-term benefits for everyone. And it's very exciting. You know, I, I'm, I'm so excited. I'm so excited by this, Angelo. And it's not that we got to go back and live in caves. It's that, you know, we're going to develop ourselves so we, so we have different goals, perhaps. And I think we're seeing from this coronavirus that we, we are capable of making these kinds of changes and people are resisting them. It's tough. We're going through a tough time, but, but we're capable of making change. John, talk to me about the prophecy of the eagle and the condor yeah. and how you see it applying today. So it's, you know, it's one of many prophecies that come from many different cultures. I mentioned the Dalai Lama, there's a prophecy of the Himalayas that's, that's, that's similar, and the Mayan prophecy of 2012, which is a very optimistic prophecy, regardless of what Hollywood seemed to want us to believe. But the eagle and the condor, so it's one of the Jewish the, the, uh, culture, the Hindu culture, uh, the Muslim culture, the Christian culture, all, there are all these prophecies. But the eagle and the condor one is, is simple. It's very straightforward. And it, it was probably first voiced in oral traditions maybe 3,000 years ago. We don't know. But a long time ago it, in the Amazon and the Andes, and it moved up through Central America. And, it's, and back then, maybe 3,000 years ago, they said, back in the midst of history, Human societies would take two different paths, two different flights. One, one part of society would take the flight of the mind, the brain, which they said was the flight of the ego, the flight of rationality, science, industry. And the other part of human society would take the flight of the condor, the flight of the heart, of passion, of, of emotion, of intuition. Of, you know, creativity, let's say, of emotion and intuition. And the prophecy said that these two paths would, would separate. These two groups of society would go in very different directions. They wouldn't connect until the fourth Pachacuti. Pachacuti in Quechua, the language of the Andes, is a 500-year interval. The fourth Pachacuti began in our calendar in 1500, about then. And it was said that during the fourth Pachacuti, the eagle and the condor would come together, they would clash, the, con the eagle would be so powerful as to practically drive the condor into extinction, but not quite. Mm. And of course, we know that's what happened. 1492, Columbus, the industrialized countries of the world practically drove the indigenous cultures into extinction, but not quite. The prophecy goes on to say that 500 years later in the fifth Pachacuti, roughly the year 2000, the opportunity arises for the eagle and the condor to, to fly in one sky, to dance, to mate, and to create an offspring that's higher consciousness, bringing heart and mind together, bringing the rational, the scientific together with the intuitive and the creative and, and, and creating this new consciousness. And of course, we've been seeing that happening. We've been seeing in the 90s when people really in the industrialized countries began to get very interested in shamanism and indigenous cultures. And we saw the indigenous people and the shamans coming out and, and saying, we need to share our knowledge and we need to learn from you also. And this has been growing ever since. It's still growing today where we've been seeing this, this happening, this coming together. Mm -hmm. And I think in a way, the climate change that we're experiencing and, and the COVID experience is, is an indication of this, that, we, that we, you can say that, that Pachamama, the earth from a, from a shamanic standpoint, is speaking to us, mm -hmm. sending us a strong message that we must change. But you can also say from a scientific standpoint, the same thing. <laughs> you know, the, the COVID-19 has shown us that when we stop driving cars in the cities and we stop some of our, our, of, of our other commercial activities uh, and fossil fuel burning activities, suddenly you see the stars in places like Los Angeles and Beijing and, and many other places. I mean, we're seeing lots and lots of signs scientifically. We're seeing how this how this how this is impacting us. So it is these two coming together. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a very inspiring vision. One of the things that you alluded to a little bit, and I want to, I want to give you a, an opportunity to explain to our listeners is some. I came to you because I heard about the Pachamama Alliance. 
I got involved in, in, in the global forum and, and you're, you're the co-founder. Tell me a little bit about Pachamama, uh, what its goals are and uh, yeah, just tell, tell the people. Yeah, and, and it, play, it plays a large role in the book, Touching the Jaguar, because it's a theme that kind of runs through because it, it so well represents uh, this transition and this coming together that, and then the idea of perception molding reality. So when I was a Peace Corps volunteer in the Amazon in the late 60s, early 70s, the, the tribes there, which are now officially nations, uh, were at war with each other, and even clans within these groups were at war with each other because they were defending their, their hunting grounds. So hunters and gatherers need large territories. And if, the, if somebody's threatening to impose upon your hunting territory, you, you'd stop them. So there were small skirmishes, really. But there's the Schwa versus the Achwa versus the Quechua versus the Warani and so on and so forth. There was this antagonism that had gone on for maybe thousands of years. And then while I was there, Texaco suddenly comes into Ecuador in the late 60s and starts drilling for oil and creating huge problems and destroying indigenous lands and indigenous cultures and killing indigenous people mm -hmm. with their mercenaries. And so suddenly they had to change their perception. The indigenous people came together and they said, hey, they're not our enemies. Our, our neighbors are not our enemies. They're our allies. Our enemy is the oil company and the mining companies. We've got to come together. And they formed federations and came together. And then they realized it's not really the oil companies and the mining companies. It's the dream of the world that depends upon oil. It's the perception of the modern world, the industrialized world, the ego world. And so they came to me, and I was already in that area. Um, but they came to me and, and, and asked me, hey, will you help us touch the jaguar? Help us reach out and join forces with the people we most fear, you and your people. Mm -hmm. Help us create a partnership, an alliance with the people we most fear so that we can help you guys change your dream. And we can all work together to change the, this terribly destructive dream of the modern world that's creating a death economy. It's a, an economic system that's destroying the resources upon which it depends in the long term in order to maximize short term profits. Uh, this destroying people and nature. And and so out of that, uh, I, I reached out to Bill and Lynn Twist, who were amazing people. And the, the three of us co-founded this Pachamama Alliance in, in, in 1995. Uh, we went back to the Amazon with, with a group of 12 people. And out of that grew this whole alliance, which is now in close to 90 countries, if not 90 countries, by now it increases every day. We have programs called the Awakening the Dreamer program. We have all these programs that help people to wake up, to mm -hmm. change the perception and to take the actions necessary to turn things around. I, I think we've been very successful. We, all, we work very closely with the indigenous people. We take groups down to visit them every year. Uh, and, you know, I, I take groups to also to indigenous people, the Mayan people in, in, Guana, in, in Central America and the Kogi people in Colombia, you can go to my website, johnperkins.org for more information. But it's this, it's this partnership to recognize that they have something very important to share because when you come right down to it, for, out of the 250,000 years that we've been human beings, as we know human beings to be on this planet, almost all that time we lived the way indigenous people do today, the traditional indigenous people, and that's changing. But, we, we, we embraced a life economy, an economic system that looked at the long term, the famous you know seventh generation. And they may only look at two generations, but so but whatever it is, it's looking, it's not this short term profit materialistic thing. It's it's a deeper spiritual connection with nature and a long term thing. And so um, you know that these these programs, like my writings and, and the Pachamama Alliance, are are about an alliance that helps to promote this this concept and to recognize and also to help the indigenous people where they they live protect their forests protect the, the amazon because without it what are we so mm -hmm. really the pachamama alliance has has two branches one is working on the ground in the amazon rainforest and with lawyers to keep oil companies and mining companies out and now the chinese are making big inroads so we're, we're going to try to keep them out too and the other branch is to try, go around the world with these programs to change the dream of the modern world because we realize ultimately you can't save nature unless we change mm -hmm. the perception we have 
of short-term maximization of materialistic profits. John, last question I want to ask you, and I've been to your blog, so I know you. I know you have. A, you, you can. Over, you can just rattle this off. There are some people that will never go to the Pachamama um, Alliance, but they they're in accord with the with the goals of it. And you talk about the transforming the death economy to the to the life account economy. What can your average person do that is uh, newly woke, let's say, to align um, to the to the life in, encounter? What are what are a couple of things practical steps that he or she might take? Well, that's a yeah, and and that's part of the reason I wrote Touching the Jaguar too, because in there I, I outline a, a daily program you can do for less than ten minutes a day, or you can do it from once a week. It doesn't have to be every day, but that that takes you in this direction. And I'll go into that a little bit in a minute. But I think one of the things we all can do is we're all aware we can shop more consciously, but it's not we shouldn't just shop more consciously. <laughs> we need to let the companies that we're not buying from know why we're not buying from them. And the companies that we do buy from know why we're buying from them because they're doing a good thing. So consumer campaigns that I, I mentioned before, writing letters and getting your social networking service. I think that's something that everybody should do. Yes, we should shop consciously, but you can't stop there. <laughs> you got to get the message out. This is about changing perception. But so this daily program, what we know is, you know, all your listeners, every one of them has passion and skills. I, I don't know what their passions and skills are but I know they have them. And so this daily method goes into how each one of us can, can use those. And it's based on f five questions. And then when you answer those five questions then you move into this practice that you can do every day or once a week, whatever. The five questions, and are, um, the first question is, what do I wanna do for the rest of my life? <laughs> what will bring me the greatest joy, the greatest satisfaction? Now I would answer that question by saying, I wanna write. I love to write. I just love to write. And I have a friend who's a carpenter, kind of the, the opposite end of the spectrum in a way. And he would say, I want to work with wood in my hands. The second question then is, how do I use this in a way that will help others? Because we're all happier, Angelo, as, as, as we all know, when we, when we help others. And it might be one other person or it might be the world. And so I would answer that question. I, I write stories that to, to inspire people to make a better life for themselves and a better world for all. And my carpenter friend would say, I want to use sustainable materials. And the third question is, what's the barrier that's keeping you from doing it, this? Mm. What's the Jaguar standing in your way? Mm. And I would answer, the writer might answer that question and say, oh, I just don't have time to write every day. And the, the carpenter might say, well, my clients don't want to pay the extra price from sustainable materials. And the fourth question is, when you touch that Jaguar, how does it change your perception? Mm. And so when I touch the Jaguar as a writer, I'd say, well, hey, I could get up half an hour earlier, or I could watch an hour less of television every night or three nights a week and write. And my carpenter friend would say, when I touch that Jaguar, the Jaguar says, well, tell your clients that the the added price of sustainable materials is not a cost it's an investment mm -hmm. they're investing in their future and their children's future mm -hmm. and then the fifth question is what actions do i take every day mm -hmm. and for a writer you're right you know for the carpenter it's like well yeah i i, I build these things with sustainable materials and i talk about it i don't have to be a and I don't have to write a poem about it. I just have to say, <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, kids, look, I just, if your dad just, if your parents just built, just paid for me to build this cabinet over here or this house using sustainable materials, it, it costs maybe a little bit more, uh, but th they are investing in your future just as though they were paying for your education or something else that would be an investment in your future. And so, you know, every one of us can do this, whether you're a carpenter or a plumber or a, 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 a radio host, or a, you know, a parent, teacher, what, whatever you are, mm -hmm. we can all apply this this five-step process. What do I most want to do for the rest mm -hmm. of my life? How will this help other people? Mm -hmm. What's keeping me from doing it? When I touch that Jaguar, how does it change my perception so I can move forward? What actions do I take every day? It's very powerful. And those last three questions and the answers will change quite frequently. So as a writer, I, I say, well, yeah, now I've created an extra hour in the day to write. So the next day, I go, well, what am I going to write about? 
<laughs> and then the jaguar after that is, well, what's my first sentence? <laughs> what? How do I get into this? And 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 so every day, but every time you answer those three last questions, and usually the the first two may stay the same, and they may change too, but the, the last three will change frequently. Every time you move, you answer them, you you rise to a higher level of consciousness and a greater personal satisfaction. Mm-hmm. And it's a great process for for moving forward into a, the life we really want for ourselves. And we know we can create for uh, help others to create and make a better world. Wow, that's uh, that's wonderful. And um, as the same the same process that happened when I read your book is um, amplified by talking to you, John. And uh, I just want to just pause before I give you a formal goodbye to say a little bit about the network, so people want to participate in it, and then I'll say goodbye. Um, um, those of you who want to know more about the Sacred Inclusion Network, simplest way is to go to our website. Um, you can also join our private Facebook group, sacredinclusion.com. Look for it on Facebook. Um, also, we have events um, we call online community explorations that are free, third Saturday of every month, 11 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. Go to our website, look for events. You'll find more about what the, what the next one is, is. And finally, if you want to support the podcast or support the network, you can find us on Patreon. And um, if you like the podcast, give us a shout out on uh, iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. John, it is a a pleasure and a privilege to connect with you and uh, to be part of your alliance and to um, help you help you share share spreading the word, shall we say? Well, thank you so much, Angela. And likewise, it's and 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 sacred inclusion is such an amazing idea, and I love the work you're doing. I'm I'm so honored to be to join you in this. I I love what you do and. Please keep it up. And through your sacred inclusion, you're just creating that sacred community. Like, you know, mm-hmm. I think the Pachamama lands, all, well, we're, you know, a lot of people working to do that. And, and we're coming together in an amazing way now. I, I, I really feel that. I think there's a consciousness revolution that's, that's, that's happening. There's an awakening around the world. I, th- I think, and it's a collective thing, too. It's not just, it's not just this group, this that group. It's, um, it's harnessing the collect- our collective energy for the true transformation. It is indeed. And we have to recognize that whenever there's a revolution, there's always pushback. The status quo fights hard to stop it, and that's happening, too. It is we, fighting. Yeah. yeah, it's fighting. But we take energy from that. You know, it's like a good martial artist. You don't try to overwhelm a guy who's a lot stronger, a lot bigger and stronger than you. You, you, t- you use his energy to energize you and, and and turn it around on him. And 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 it's very much like that, you know, we're, so when we feel that pushback from politicians or business people, whoever, to recognize that they're pushing back because they're scared, because they know that, that we're gonna, that we're winning and, and we use that energy. So it's a great time to be alive. It's so blessed, I feel so blessed. I think we should all feel blessed to be alive at this time with terrible problems and incredible opportunities.